Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of History That Doesn't Suck. I am your professor, Greg Jackson. As you know, we are typically doing a narrative history of the United States. We're currently in the midst of World War I. But while I was researching and writing the last episode, which went quite in depth on Bellow Wood, where many a legend of the U.S. Marine Corps was born in the midst of death, uh, I had the pleasure of getting to know Captain Mac Caldwell. Um, in, in the process, the captain is a very well-spoken and intelligent, capable Marine officer. So, we'll uh, see. Oh, no, with, with, without fail, sir. Uh, Captain, let me go ahead and give you a proper introduction. You feel free to interject when I get something wrong in your bio. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and talk a bit more about Bella Wood because as we were texting and, and talking, and again, I'm so grateful for you giving of your time, I could just feel your passion and your depth of knowledge on Bella Wood mm. and, and how it even speaks to the Marine Corps today. I remember thinking in the midst of our conversation, okay, this is one for everyone. It, I am selfish to keep this man to myself. So, <laughs> but uh, Captain Matt Caldwell, you are, uh, again, a Marine Corps infantry officer. You're currently serving right here in beautiful Salt Lake City, Utah. Yes, I am. Lifelong lover of history. And um, you've, uh, you actually graduated from the United States Air Force Academy. I did. So we'll, uh, we'll get into that oh, little, yeah. little be betrayal if we can. <laughs> You majored in law and uh, political science, and you have been with the Marines since. You're, you're a graduate of uh, Basic Free Fall, the Marine Infantry Officer course, uh, and uh, and forgive me, the Marine Corps Expeditionary Warfare School. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did I botch that too badly? That was beautiful. What, far more eloquent than I could do myself, but thanks for the introduction, <laughs> Greg. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to chat with you and you know, one thing I will say, I, I had I told you I had to poke fun at you a little bit. You're welcome to. I, in preparing to come down and meet with you, I re-listened to episode 62 because I'm a native of Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. And for your listeners, if they go re-listen to episode 62, it's about the Chickamauga and Chattanooga campaign yes, sir. in the Civil War. and um, Or as people back home would say, the war between the states. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay. I'm gonna watch myself there, right? <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. No, but I had to give you a hard time because uh, y your French is too good, Greg. You keep talking about this town called Lafayette, Georgia, and uh, or Lafayette, but back home we call it Lafayette. Lafayette. It's Lafayette. Yep. I'll tell you what, there, the, uh, man. My eyes has heard this so many times when when I, I break the fourth wall in some of these these conversations. Uh, the United States. <sighs> Primarily English speaking, so much French influence, so much Spanish influence, mm -hmm. indigenous languages, you know, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Yeah. We are, we're just a mess when mm -hmm. it comes to, yeah, it's written this way and it's said this way in this <laughs> state, but it's said that way in that one. And yeah. Right. There's uh well, but thank you. I appreciate the the compliment and I'm sorry absolutely. I didn't, um, didn't nail that one. You know, the... The, the Confederate States of America lost that battle, and history is written by the victors, so it will live on as Lafayette. Um, <laughs> okay. But, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this, I'm sure, later on. History is written by the victor. And as we look at the Battle of Bella Wood, uh, I'll lead off by saying it was not a resounding victory. The reality of that fight is it was awful. Yeah. The casualties that Marines of the 4th Marine Brigade assumed relative to the German defenders of Bella Wood uh, were almost three to one. I mean, the, the defender has a decisive advantage in any conflict. That's what German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, when, when he was fighting through Italy and North Africa in World War II and studying, you know, how offensive operations function, he said that the ideal ratio of forces in, in, in the offense should be 9 to 1 or even as much as 25 to 1 because the defender has such a decisive advantage of the terrain, entrenchment, so on and so forth. And that was witnessed, you know, for four years during the First World War. But Bella Wood was not a resounding, beautiful, glorious victory for the Marines. That it was not. Um, and you know what? Let's go ahead and table that, though, for just one oh, yeah. second. Just no. one second. Getting too far. No, no, no. I love it. I love the energy. You're, you're ready to go. Uh, th there was one thing I want to do before we dive right into Bella Wood. And, uh, and th this came out of, well, it came right out of our conversation uh, I could tell you've got a depth of knowledge that I, of course, I, I can't and won't have on on the core. Uh, 
kind of shorten it like that. We all right to call it the core? Yes. All right. As long as you don't say the corpse. People who say the corpse, that that tears up my heart a little bit. Uh, again, the French, right? <laughs> the French go. speaking. I, yeah. I know to drop the <laughs> those last letters. So uh, give us a little bit more background because as we get into Bella Wood, as my listeners know from the last episode, mm-hmm. we see more casualties on June 6th alone than the Corps has seen in its entire history since the American Revolution. Yes. And by the time the campaign's over, over those few weeks of fighting in Bella Wood, we have more deaths al- e- even. For, forget even the the... Uh, wounded and the MIA, just deaths alone, more in Bellow Wood than any in U.S. history for the Marine Corps. Yep. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about what this Corps is. What, how do we get from the revolution to Bellow Wood? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, that's not a... Yeah. Not, not a huge ask, right? Just go ahead and convey yeah, that in a few let's, minutes. Let's condense 130 years of history, shall we? Sure. Um, well, let me start by saying I'm, I am an active duty Marine, but I am not here as a representative of the Marine Corps. So, you know, the little asterisk next to my name should be that my thoughts and and comments today are, are in no ways the official communique of the United States Marine Corps. But I am excited to share what I as a Marine know and understand about my service and the lore and the prestige that is being a United States Marine. And it may come across as arrogant, but the reality is that as Marines, we take great pride in our history. And that all began in 1775, 10 November. Uh, The Second Continental Congress commissioned a young man named Captain Samuel Nicholas to raise two battalions that would become the the first Continental Marines, uh, the first and the second battalion of Continental Marines. And knowing that this would be, by its very nature, a maritime force designed for naval engagements and shipside combat um, and occasional combat in the littoral environment along the shores and rivers, uh, Captain Nicholas knew that he needed to find gritty, tough human beings. So naturally, he went to a bar. (laughs) And he set up, he literally set up a table in Tun Tavern in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he signed up a bunch of drunkards and castoffs of American society. So Philly Tavern, that's, yeah, that's ton, where we get the Marine Tavern, Corps. Huh? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Marine Corps started in a bar, uh, which is very much still a part of our ethos today. But <laughs> that the Continental Marines were, they were the beginning. Uh, when you hear the term leatherneck, right? You, yes, you, you'll which I mentioned in the episode. So yeah, what, what what's this leatherneck business? Leatherneck was a colloquialism ascribed to Marines at the early, you know, in the early beginnings of the Marine Corps that described this leather, essentially band that Marines wore around their neck. Uh, And that was designed as a defense to their head and their neck from conflict by sword. So when Marines would engage in, in combat from ship to ship, Right. This is like the grappling hooks have come out where yes, butted up broadside to broadside. Yeah. People are going to swap blood. Um, Those I'll I'll tell you, I, I, I am, studying and writing about the war of 1812 for this podcast mm-hmm. uh years ago now uh it piqued my interest in naval history i was just so fascinated at how the ships themselves function of all the wars and battles <laughs> that, you know this podcast is really taking me all over the place mm-hmm. social history military history you name it those seem like the most terrifying oh gosh to me. yeah i mean it, it, especially in the times that we're talking about I learned to swim when I was four years old. I mean, many Americans today have access to maybe a community pool or a lake or, you know, if you're really lucky, the ocean and you learn how to swim. People didn't know how to swim in 1775. That was not a common, joyous way to spend an afternoon. You don't go to the lake and, you know, celebrate the 4th of July and go swimming. And so for many of these sailors... It was a less common uh, ability. mm -hmm. For many of these sailors and Marines... They didn't know how to swim. They were surrounded by death. Uh, if if the ship goes down, you're dead. Not to mention the fact that they're covered in wool clothing uh, to the right. tune of eight to 10 pounds worth of equipment. So even if they are fairly decent at treading water, yeah, that's... Yeah. Miles and miles from shore, falling off the ship is death. Um, but the Marines, they prefer to fight on the ship. And so when two ships would come broadside to broadside, the job of the Marines was to go conquer the other ship. So they would go over the bulkhead and engage, you know, they, they were in such close proximity that most of the fights that took place were by sword at that time. And so that leather neck 
was that piece of leather surrounding their neck designed to prevent an enemy's sword from being able to slice through their head. Uh, as gruesome as that yeah. may sound, the leather neck was a protection. And so Marines became known as leathernecks. And it was not necessarily a term of honor and distinction, <laughs> right? That's and, a really polite way to... And, and those terms, that. those yeah. terms have followed Marines. Um, nowadays, we're called crayon eaters. And I lean into that. I tell people my favorite flavor is green, right? So... <laughs> Um, okay. As Marines, we're we're just proud of the fact that we're we're viewed as a rugged, oftentimes rudimentary force. All the right. reality is we're tough, we're gritty, and we try to be smart. But leathernecks, that's where the term came from. Okay. No, I'm I'm capturing this the overall vision here. We're born in a tavern, mm -hmm. leathernecks. Mm -hmm. and I can see the the grit persona mm -hmm. that that carries with this you know, as you're describing the the naval battles i am of course picturing master and commander the film in my oh, great movie in, in my head it, it is an excellent movie yeah. um excellent soundtrack as well yes okay so uh we, we, the, the leathernecks uh the marines they're gritty what role do they play in some of the conflicts that you know precede world war one yeah. so Obviously, the, the, the American Revolution, we, we see a little more engagement on the waters than, mm -hmm. say, the Civil War. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, speak to any of these if you can. Sure. So the Marine Corps did not exist in continuity from its founding in 1775. There was an, actually a, an, an interwar period between the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 where the Marine Corps was stood down and didn't oh, exist. Uh, the only standing army, if you will— that the United States maintained was the Department of the Navy and the Army, both of which fell under the Secretary of War. And both of which were very small compared to- Extremely small. To Tay. Yes. World War I is that big shift. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, America was an isolationist country. We had our own continent, uh, so to speak. And, and so the idea of maintaining a standing force didn't jive with most Americans who were weary of war and the Marine Corps was a casualty of that, for better or worse. Right. And, of course, the states maintained militias. The, mm -hmm. the Guard. Yep. Yes. The, the predecessor of today's National Guard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but the Marine Corps did come back in the late 18th century and um, had limited involvement in the War of 1812. Marines were in Tripoli, Libya in the early 19th century. We were, at, you know, you'll hear in the Marines hymn, the Halls of Montezuma. Right. Marines were involved in the Mexican-American War, which okay. included an amphibious landing in Mexico yep. Yep. Uh, and a march all the way to, you know. Things that for longtime listeners, I'm sure they're getting they're having some flashbacks yes. to those episodes. Yes. Yep. And, and these are important components of our history that are often overlooked. But the reality is the Marine Corps was extremely small. We, we were a maritime defense force that could conduct amphibious infantry operations at that point in our history. And we gradually grew very limited involvement with the United States Navy in the, the Civil War and with the Confederate States Navy, uh, even less so. But the, the Marine Corps did not play a significant role in that conflict. Uh, however, it, later on, as you know, especially in small wars, which is kind of the Marine Corps specialty at, throughout history, we thrive in small war situations. Okay. At the very end of the 19th century, the Marine Corps started to gain steam. In the eyes of Congress, in the eyes of the American people, there was more value. So, you know, respectfully, follow me here for, for just a second. Then, yeah. if I can just play devil's advocate, do it. Uh, so, we do have the Navy. Mm -hmm. So, there's the sea. Mm -hmm. We got the Army. That that's the land, and of course, uh, the air. That's not even a factor until we really get to World War One, right? The Wright brothers kind of have to come along and and do their thing. So, why why have the Marines? That's a great question, and. It's an existential question that has been asked often, including in the halls of Congress. Why are we footing billions of dollars, you know, at the time, millions of dollars towards this service that is effectively redundant, right? The, the capabilities that the Marine Corps has, doesn't the Army have those? Yes. Doesn't the Navy have the capability to handle amphibious operations with naval special warfare and SEAL teams? And yes. So then why should the Marine Corps exist? And this was a question that was famously asked you know, a number, number of years ago to the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And he said, quite frankly, and I think to his credit, he said, America doesn't need a Marine Corps. America wants a Marine Corps. Marines are different. And I'm no longer quoting. Marines are different. 
the way we train, the way we fight, the character and the ethos of who we are as United States Marines, we are different. And I say that as someone who you know, spent four years at the Air Force Academy learning to become an airman. I have the yeah. <laughs> deepest and utmost respect for the Air Force. I, I even did a semester at the Naval Academy. I've deployed on naval shipping. Okay. Um, the Marine Corps is different. We are different. And that's what America, frankly, wants. America wants a force that, you know, throughout the 20th century would become known as the shock troops. We, we were America's maritime force and readiness, expeditionary force and readiness, it then became. When the nation needed someone to be there overnight, like UPS, that's us. <laughs> so, all right, running with that, yeah, is is that part of how we even end up with Marines in the AEF? So, World mm. War One, we're talking about Black Jack Pershing, the, the commander of, of the AEF, and the Fourth Marines. This is the only Marine unit in yes. the whole AEF, mm -hmm. and it, it does, in my mind, it. You know, I say this as someone who's who's never served. I'm not. I'm not attached to the military. I want your insider perspective here, you know? How odd is that? Or is it not odd for the Marines to have this one unit inside was otherwise a U.S. Army right. uh, deployment? Right. Well, fighting abroad had been the specialty of the Marine Corps in, in history. And again, if we put this conflict in context, in 1917, 1918, you know, the Marine Corps less than 20 years before had rather famously fought in Cuba in the Philippines, in the Boxer sure. Rebellion in China, right? Um, yeah. Marines were involved in conflict internationally. And so there was a certain level of repute about the Marine Corps okay. that led the American, you know, the AEF to say, why don't we call up a brigade, the 4th Marine Brigade uh, of Marines to come to France and join in the fighting because they have experience. They Which fought. we desperately need. I yes. mean, we're training... We're training troops with freaking mm -hmm. broomsticks, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, so someone who actually knows what they're doing is yes. invaluable. And, and to be fair, the level of experience that Marines brought was very, very small. The overwhelming majority of the Marines that fought in the 4th Marine Brigade had just enlisted, right? Had, had answered the draft call and, and the decision to serve because they wanted to be Marines. They wanted to be a part of this legend, this sort of opaque idea of a force. This tavern invoking leatherneck tradition. Yes, yes, exactly. They they wanted to be okay. part of the drinking buddies that are the United States Marine Corps. They wananted to join the gun club. Well, uh, do, do you feel we've laid, uh, we've laid some good track to get us to Bella Wood? If I can say one more thing, one thing that that I think is important to the context of the whole fight here for the Americans is we were unproven. And as I know you've mentioned about in the last couple episodes, the Americans were not a force at this point that could be relied upon in the eyes of, of the Brits and the French right. and their allies. Uh, we, were, we, there, we were there to help, but we were not an ally yet. Right. Until well, and and the, the Germans even went back to unrestricted warfare with the thought, oh, the Americans can't get this together fast enough. Yes. There's just no way. Yeah. And in the spring offensive, you know, the, before the Battle of Bella Wood, the Germans had very little respect for the Marines. They thought that the Marines were going to be this green, fresh bunch of people who thought that, you know, warfare was this glorious endeavor. Well, and, you know, to be fair, putting putting that context together, these European militaries, they've been at war for years. They're a bunch of hardened veterans. Mm. Uh, I can absolutely see where they would look at the United States with, at that time, a very small military, mm -hmm. right? the, the National Guard outnumbered yep. the federal, if you will, uh, forces. Yep. Uh, you know, we, we can talk about, yeah, some of the experience in Spanish-American War, um, uh, other small conflicts mm -hmm. uh, into the Philippines. But yeah, it's just nothing compared to total war. You're right. The level of experience just wasn't there. So the context that I want to provide is there was a chip on the shoulder of every American in the AEF. Uh, yes. Even more so, it's pretty well documented. There was no love lost between Black Jack Pershing and the United States Marine Corps. He was not a vocal advocate okay. of Marines. And so that ship that every American carried magnify that by a power of 10 for every Marine. Because the Marines of the 4th Brigade, they were, again... They were different. They were outcasts. 
They were set aside and apart. But one last thing I'll say before we really get into the details of the battle, um, the commander of the 4th Marine Brigade, as, as you know, the conflict was about to begin, he experienced a, an issue with his health and was replaced. And when General Pershing wrote to the new commander, he said, I'm giving you the best brigade in France. So if it all fails, I will know who to blame. And that was, you know, again, no love lost between Pershing and the Marines. But that statement, I think, was a testament to the fact that he knew Marines fight differently. And he expected that when the conflict came, not if, but when, as we uh -huh. know in the Great War, it was, it was going to happen. But he knew that the 4th Marine Brigade was the unit that he wanted at the hardest battle whenever that fight came. Well, and as the, the AEF is just getting started, that hardest battle is Bella Wood. It is. So let's take a, a quick break and let's get into, get into some of that ugly. So we've established who the Marines are. Um, and importantly, I'd say uh, kind of the, the insider perspective, how, how the Marines see themselves. That's, that is the unique thing, Captain. Cap. Can, can we do Cap? Eh, call me whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, th that's the unique thing that you can bring here, uh, th that you do bring uh, beyond just your, your depth of knowledge on Bella Wood itself. Listeners know from the last episode, the broad strokes of Bella Wood, mm -hmm. uh, to briefly paint the scene, we're in the third wave of the German Spring Offensive, a massive salient that is huge bulge has developed on the lines as uh, Ludendorff, the German general, is attempting to simply divert to uh, get the French to pay attention to things down by the Marne River and not think about the KO punch he's about to land up in Flanders against the Brits. Mm -hmm. But of course... He he's far more successful than he could have ever dreamed. And suddenly, uh, Paris is only 50 miles away. How do we not go on? Yep. Pétain turns to the AEF, to Black Jack, says, please, mm -hmm. s'il vous plaît. Uh, some, some troops, some men. We get the second and third. And of course, within those forces, we have the fourth. Yes. The fourth Marines. And so, Bella Wood, uh, June 6th. This is, uh, is it too much for me to say this is like a, a rebirth of the Marine Corps? It really is. This is where much of the legend that is the Marine Corps today started. And it started as a result of a French force that, for all intents and purposes, was fighting on its heels. And as the Germans made progress in this sector of the conflict, they, and we talk a lot about in the military, especially in the Marine Corps, about centers of gravity and critical vulnerabilities. Centers of gravity being that thing that you or the enemy has that you can use to your advantage to win the fight and a critical vulnerability being the gap or the lapse that, if exploited, can defeat your center of gravity or defeat the enemy's center of gravity. Well, the Germans viewed, they viewed this part of the line as the critical vulnerability in okay. France's line. This was 53 miles from Paris, easy road to take all the way to Paris, and this was a vulnerability that they wanted to exploit. So they threw division after division after division at this segment of the line. And the French took the brunt of that blow. As the French were essentially retreating and withdrawing out of um, the Bella Wood area, the Meuse Argonne area in on the 5th, is very famously said uh, to Captain Lloyd Williams of the 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, you should retreat. Like we're retreating, why are you here? Marines, you should be retreating. And Captain Williams responded as one of one of the famous quotes, and he said, oh, retreat, yeah. hell, we just got here. <laughs> and that was the mindset that the Marines took into this fight. So the 4th Marine Brigade, consisting of two regiments, the 5th Marines and the 6th Marines, each with three battalions. And there was also the 6th Machine Gun Battalion, which was a Marine Machine Gun Battalion. So seven battalions in total that okay. were postured to take on this German uh, so just force. Real quick, brigade, battalion, we're just talking the next next level down. Yes. Right? I, I just want to make sure that listeners are all following this. Mm -hmm. I, sometimes I think these terms, they just kind of, whoa, they, yes. you know, they, they're they they're almost overwhelming. Yeah, let me clarify that. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I have my own cheat sheet anytime I get into these, <laughs> uh, you know, these military episodes. I'm like, okay, I'm going to 
And I got to, of course, double check, right? How, what's changed since the last war? Yep. Uh, so by all means, anything more you want to say on that? Sure. Have at it. Uh, a battalion is a, is a maneuver element consisting of approximately a thousand Marines. Okay. So 800 to 1200, somewhere in that range. A regiment consists of three to four battalions. So a regiment borders on about 4,000 Marines. A brigade consists of about two regiments. So okay. again, we're talking echelons of force here. The 4th Marine Brigade consists, that was the entirety of the Marines in France. Right. Consisted of two regiments, each of about 4,000 Marines. Okay. And those regiments were further broken down into three battalions apiece. Okay. There and we so go. The, the battalions are the important maneuver elements in this fight. Uh, the battalions are going to be oriented, you know, all six of them with the machine gun battalion, the seventh, you know, supporting. Um, they're going to be oriented essentially along a north-south running line at uh, Bois de Bello, so Bella Wood. And the Germans have set in a defensive position inside of the wooded area. On the 4th of June, the Marines had sent out a reconnaissance patrol. Uh, you know, First Lieutenant Edie had gone out and literally he's, he spoke fluent German. He and his Marines hid in bushes close enough to the German lines. It's crazy. This is how we used to do intelligence and surveillance, right? They hid close enough to the Germans that they could listen to their conversation and determine generally how the Germans were postured and how they intended to fight um, against the 4th Marine Brigade. Which yeah, again, that'll... <laughs> that, that'll make the hair stand on, uh, on a little bit, a little bit, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm sure they were they were a little puckered in that. situation. Yeah, yeah, puckered is another word that comes to mind. <laughs> I, I'm just thinking about even the process of getting out there. Yes, I, yeah. Well, reconnaissance was done at night, um, yes. and you know, in World it's War still One, terrifying. Though. Oh yeah, I mean, come on, absolutely. It's it's not like today where you can drop your you know night vision goggles and you have your your great way of seeing your know, thermals and whatever. Right. They went out under the cover of clouds and. You know, with li what little starlight or moonlight may have peeked through. And that's how they found a position to listen to the enemy and find out the Germans' posture. And that was the intel that drove the brigade commander to orient his six battalions and say, ready, go. Okay. And so the Germans were entrenched on, on, so on 6 June, which ironically is D-Day. Right. You know, 20, what, 26 years later. Yep, we will get to that eventually. <laughs> yeah, but barely 100 miles away. Oh, that, yeah, that was um, very much not lost on me as I was looking at this going, really? Right. It's June 6th? Yes, yeah, it's crazy. And 6 June meant something very different in 1943 to the average American than it meant in 1944. Yeah. Um, but that being said, the Germans were, unbeknownst to the Americans, because the intel was not complete, very well dug in in Bella Wood. They had a number of machine gun positions that were um, in defilade, right? So the, the, the Germans had dug beyond chest deep. They had a well-defended trench line. Their machine guns were behind cover and concealment, so their positions wouldn't be revealed prematurely. Oh, wow. And they were at the edge, the western edge of this wooded area. To the west, there were several wheat fields, that extended anywhere from 200 to 400 meters wide. And that was the linear danger area, we call it, right? So this, this was, or excuse me, a cross compartmental danger area, a large dangerous section of terrain that the Marines would have to cross in order to get to where they could effectively engage the and Germans. And it's pretty much totally open. Yes, wide open. Just wheat, the occasional poppy. Mm -hmm. It's like charging across two to four football fields. Yes. Yeah, w while getting shot at. Yeah. Um, and it, I wanted to equate this to, you know, in, in 19, or excuse me, 1863, um, Pickett's Charge was the last ditch effort that the, the Army of Northern Virginia ditched against the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg. Right. And it failed. And it was a long, if you've been to Gettysburg, you know what this yep. looks like. It, it kind of goes through a, a short, narrow valley. Uh, which split by a creek, and then Pickett and his men were meant to come up on the far side and take the Union position that was in a bit of a hill. The wheat fields in Bella Wood were much like that. Pickett lost de decisively. Yeah. That, and that was, you know, many historians will say the high watermark of the Confederacy. That was it. Yep. That was the turning point. And this fight at Bella Wood had the potential to go the same way. 
And here, if we equate the Union position to the German position, they were dug in, they were entrenched, they had an advantageous piece of terrain. And the, the Marines, in this case, were going to have to cross no man's land yeah. to get to where they could actually fight the enemy. Generally, in World War I, these, these sort of assaults were accompanied by effective cascading artillery. Yes, a rolling barrage. A rolling yes. barrage, right? But go ahead and explain that a little bit more. What, what is, I, I've, I've used that term in a number of episodes. Please, layman's terms, what, what is a rolling barrage? A rolling barrage is essentially dropping bombs in front of you as you walk so you get the enemy to duck. That's the whole point. Um, if the artillery doesn't kill the enemy, which oftentimes it doesn't, It'll make him put his head down. So he can't shoot at you. Yes. Yeah. When he can't see you, he's probably not going to be pulling the trigger because that's a waste of his limited ammunition. Right. So the the point of the rolling barrage was to put the enemy's heads down. And the closer and closer the assaulting force got to the enemy's trench line, the more the artillery would back off to the point where once the ass assaulting force was within small arms range of the trench line, the artillery would cease at that point, it's a small arms fight. Right. Now, that rolling barrage, it wasn't going to work at Bella Wood. And the reason it wasn't going to work was because artillery at the time, the munitions that were fired were not intended to be used in wooded areas. They were meant for open areas. The way that the round worked, right? And we're going to get very technical here. Okay. The round had a, essentially a, a cone-shaped munition at the front of the round that once crushed, as soon as it impacted anything, the round would explode. So for Germans in a tree line, those rounds were exploding above their head, 40, 50, 60 feet high up in the canopy of this forest. So for all the artillery that the Americans and the French lobbed at the Germans in, the, in Bella Wood, mm -hmm. it had very little effect on the Germans and it didn't put their heads down because they weren't scared. The trees were gonna take the brunt of the force of that artillery barrage. So those machine gunners in their defensive positions were able to look out across the wheat field. And when the Marines were given the order to charge uh, and they, they started, you know, running across the wheat fields, the Germans' heads were up. And like I'm sure we'll talk about later, this was not a glorious, beautiful, you know, fight like you yeah. see from Gettysburg of Joshua Chamberlain leading his men down the hill with their bayonets fixed. This was a bloody deadly assault. And just 60 years prior, you know, the, the tactic of the day was a linear assault, you know, stand up in formation, everyone get online, we're going to charge across well, this field. And those tactics, the AEF, I mean, Blackjack Pershing, uh, I'll, I'll go Southern for you, my, my Southern friend, uh, bless, his, bless his heart. Yes. Um, he is still a fan of many of those tactics. Mm -hmm. And he's been very uh, slow to give heed to the French and British as mm -hmm. they're saying, actually tr trench warfare is pretty important to understand, not just open warfare. Yep. And he's, he also hasn't grasped the value of artillery. He, he's not turned that corner. Uh, so I know those are also factors here. They absolutely at, are. At Bella Wood. So, I mean, we've, we've got kind of an old school approach and, uh, and what artillery is being fired. I, I actually wasn't aware of that part. It's just blowing up over their heads. It's ineffective. Um, yeah. So they, they didn't bring enough and they didn't use, and it wasn't effective to boot. And, and no longer like in 1863, are these men charging against, you know, maybe a, a sharps repeating rifle that shoots 14 rounds a minute right? or against a, you know, a single shot musket. Yeah, no, this is 500, 500 rounds yes. in a minute. They're, they're marching against well lubricated, capable enemy machine guns yep. that are designed to eat meat. And that's what they did. And the assault across the wheat fields by both um, the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines and the 3rd Battalion, 6th Marines proved extremely deadly. And in under normal circumstances, this would have been the time for a novice green new force to tuck tail and run. Hey, this isn't working. Let's right. get back in this the This is insane. Line. This is stupid. We're dying. Yeah, Let's we're all going to die. There are many accounts of Marines who, you know, I, I was listening to one earlier of a Marine platoon commander who got within 20 meters of the Bella Wood tree line and turned around and said, where's my platoon? And they were all dead or wounded in the field behind them. Oh all of them, but six, right? Right. Um, 
And we'll talk about Floyd Gibbons in a minute. I don't know if you referenced oh, him yeah. in the last episode. Yeah, but briefly, right? So yeah. let's, uh, I'm happy to get into it to more details yeah. on him. Uh, why, why don't we, if, if I'm not tearing you away from where you'd like to go, could we talk about um, George Hamilton a bit? Absolutely. Let's, um, let's go there. That feels like the natural next place. Yeah. And, and, and he's someone that's near and dear to my heart because he was a member of 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, a company commander. That was my unit. When I no was way. in the Fleet Marine Force, I was part of 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, Company A, uh, which is, we're, you know, 1-5 is the most highly decorated unit in the Marine Corps. We've been in every major engagement the Marine Corps has ever fought. And George Hamilton uh, is, is a, he's an iconic figure of 1-5's history. Uh, you'll hear me say 1535. That is a reference to the 1st Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment. Okay. Or the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment. So 15 was assigned with the seizure of Hill 142, which was part of the wooded area. They had a shorter uh, field to cross, right? So they, they crossed the field. And the moment they entered the tree line, Captain Hamilton and his Marines encountered a well entrenched enemy defense, which is, <laughs> as an assailant, you don't want to fight against that. Like it's a, it, it's suicide. You're walking in on someone who has cover, concealment, and firepower, and he's already aiming his weapon system at you. And you're out of breath because you just did this break off run across an open field, and you come into a trench line you don't know. And that's when most of the Marines got shot, right when they entered the tree line. But Captain Hamilton knew that in order to gain the advantage over the enemy, they had to seize Hill 142. And in the Marine Corps, we talk a lot about, you know, one of the Marine Corps leadership principles is set the example. We have, we have these leadership principles that are very important to us as a service and set the example is one of the most important. George Hamilton set the example. When he entered the tree line, his Marines tell the story and he was actually recommended for the Medal of Honor, um, which was eventually reduced to a distinguished service cross. But he killed four Germans in hand-to-hand -hand combat in the forest. Right? We're hand-to-hand -hand combat is not, we're, That's we're not gruesome. talking, yeah, yeah, we're not, you know, he didn't stand five feet away and shoot someone. That would have been nice for him. He, his, you know, hands around throats, Ugh. punching, pulling, pulling hair, ears, gouging eyes. But these are nightmares. This is yeah. what, the yeah. sort of thing that torments a soldier for the rest of their lives. Absolutely. And that was what was required of every Marine that fought at Bella Wood because they were fighting in immensely close proximity. Many of these Marines, they fixed their bayonets and the weapon of choice was not the bullet. It was the bayonet and the bare hand and the knife. And so much of what the Marines proved at the Battle of Bella Wood was a willingness, just the sheer willingness to fight that way. And George Hamilton embodied that. He, he again, he could have tucked tail and run. Um, which some Marines did, by the way, right? We're not all built that way. Right. But George Hamilton led his, at that point, very small company uphill 142 in hand-to-hand -hand combat and beat the Germans off by sheer force of will. And um, maybe we'll come to this later, but there's a very famous painting that hangs at the infantry the, officer course in Mitchell Hall. It. Yeah, and uh, at the basic school in Quantico, Virginia. And that painting depicts a member of 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, Captain Hamilton's unit, standing over a German soldier, bayoneting him in the chest. Right? That is a gruesome image. Yeah. That's not something that I hope anyone listening to this podcast looks at and says, wow, that's so awesome. Right. It's terrible. It's awful. And that's how we as Marines have to fight. War is an ugly thing. It is, it is gruesome, bloody. It's filled with death. It's filled with honor and dishonor. Yeah. It, is, it is not something that is should be glorified or dignified as this beautiful chorus of fire and, and valor. It is an ugly thing. And I'm saying that as someone who's never been to combat. I haven't. I joined the Marine Corps in 2016. And, you know, for, for most of the Marine Corps, OIF and OEF, you know, the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were for all intents and purposes coming to an end when I joined. Okay. So I didn't see that fight, but the Marine Corps trained me to be ready for it. And that's how we train all of our Marines today. So that, that portrait of a Marine bayoneting a German soldier in the chest, staring him in the eye, like think of the intimacy in that moment. That's what George Hamilton did by killing four Germans face to face, eye to eye, man to man, and taking their life 
in his own hands. He, he embodied what Marines would have to do to win that fight. Um, and that level of bravery was seen all over the war. But it just so happened that there was a wartime reporter from the Chicago Tribune named Floyd Gibbons, who was actually there that day with 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. So 3-5 actually crossed one of those long wheat fields. And Floyd Gibbons was with 3-5 during the crossing. He actually wrote about that lieutenant who turned around and said, where the hell is my platoon? Well, sir, they're dead or fallen. And Floyd Gibbons, not long after that moment, you know, himself wearing the tin hat and... and it's nuts that he... Oh my gosh. Did, yeah. Can you believe that? Um, uh, honestly, on, only barely. It's, yeah, it's remarkable. If, if I... Yeah. If I didn't read it myself, if I didn't see the photos of this man, uh, as I'm sure you know, and I actually wasn't able, I tried to work this into the last episode. There just wasn't a natural place for it yeah. uh, to highlight Floyd that much, but uh, he lost an eye. He did. Uh, he was he was thought to be dead. I was able to, I was able to fit that part in, but yeah, the, he lost an eye permanently. Floyd Gibbons was shot three times on his march across the wheat field with the Marines. And to his credit, as a member of the press, walked shoulder to shoulder with Marines across that wheat field with 3-5. And while he was in the prone, not 20 meters from the boundary of Bella Wood, um, around from a machine gun, ricocheted. He said he, he was his face was about six inches off the ground. It ricocheted off the ground, entered his the left side of his face through his jaw, split his eye, and then came out of his head and his forehead, right, like right above his, you know, oh my gosh, his ocular bone, whatever that's called. There, I'm not a not a doctor. <laughs> that's um, okay. And you painted a plenty vivid picture. That's warfare. And, and he was also shot twice in the arm. Um, and you know, after realizing that, he took account of himself. And 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 having served with Marines for the last few days and weeks, I think he understood the ethos that a Marine had to have, which was well, this is my situation and this is how I'm going to fight out of it. He realized, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm shot up pretty badly. I'm alive and I need to get out somehow. So he laid as still as he possibly could for three hours, managed to then get pulled after the Marines had, you know, gotten into the wood and gained some ground. He was pulled back to the rear, sent to the United States. But while he was in the rear area, shortly after he'd been wounded, he penned a letter with his good eye, right? Yep. Uh, can you believe this? I mean, you can't write this stuff. Um, can't make it up. Is it, he yeah. he penned a letter of everything he had seen that day at the Battle of Bella Wood. And at the time, everything had to go through a sensor. You know, everything from the front had to go through a warfare sensor before it could go back to the American press to be written up in the papers. Yeah. And the sensor believed that these were Floyd Gibbons' last words. He was convinced that this man who'd been shot in the face was dead. So he said, you know what? I'm not going to censor this article. I should give Floyd Gibbons the dignity of every, every word that he wrote and let it reach the air. And it did reach the Chicago Tribune. And Floyd Gibbons' account of 6 June 1918 was instrumental in what made the Marine Corps, forgive me, I'm almost a little emotional about it. No, it, okay. it. It was instrumental in what made the Marine Corps special in the eyes of the everyday American. Because he account he he gave an account of just unbelievable bravery and courage, which is one of our core values, to stare the enemy in the face and keep walking toward him. Like that is that's crazy, right? <laughs> I think so. Yes. And that's who we are as Marines. We're just a little bit crazy. Floyd Gibbons, amazing story. Uh, we talked about tactics earlier. I want to come back to it. At the time, so much of warfare was this, you know, linear swinging of forces and marching in a line shoulder to shoulder to get from point A to point B. Well, the Marines very rapidly learned they needed to instead use a tactic called cover and movement, which is still something that we practice in the infantry today. Okay. Uh, Marines listening to the podcast will, will know the phrase, I'm up, they see me, I'm down. That's what we call cover and movement, where you and a buddy or two adjacent units engaging an enemy, you know, the lead unit fires while the rear unit stands up, gains ground, and then hits the deck. 
and then they swap positions and the other right. one does you so just and cover each other exactly forward yeah okay. that that method of cover and movement I won't say, I can't say definitively it was the first time it was used. But they're figuring out, okay, these old school open warfare tactics don't work. Let's try something different. Yes. And the Marine Corps learned those lessons in blood in the wheat field west of Bella Wood. The 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines and 3rd Battalion, 6th Marines. That's where cover and movement became a common part. And again, I don't want to overstep my knowledge of history here, but that's where it really became known as a successful tactic and engaging a superior enemy position, cover and move. And so that tactic eventually got the Marines into the woods. Uh, if I could go, I, w- I want to come back to the 3rd Battalion, 6 Marines. Sure. Marines um, love to talk about a guy named Dan Daly. Oh, yeah. Sergeant Major Dan Daly, he would eventually become. Uh, on this day, he was a company first sergeant and had the rank of gunnery sergeant with 3rd Battalion, 6 Marines. And... Uh, Gunny Daly, at the time, had already received two medals of honor, one in the Boxer Rebellion and then one, um, I believe, in I Haiti, say f- Haiti in 1915. I, I could be botching that. No, nope. so. you, you, th- th- I, I am 99%. Or we'll just leave it at 99% so we can just spare some of those yeah. emails. But I am, <laughs> I am 99%. And if sure. I'm wrong, Marines, forgive me. Uh, um, it, was, it was Haiti. Yeah, yes. but but... Gunny Daly was renowned for his heroism. I mean, he was, he, at the time, he was the only living Marine who had received two Medals of Honor, mm-hmm. just a, a god among men in the eyes of his Marines. Well, I actually find interesting, uh, if you'll forgive me for interjecting, how small he was, mm-hmm. too. The guy weighed 130 some pounds. This Don't is you love not, that? Well, I mean, when you think Medal of Honor, you think Marine, you, at least in my head, I'm picturing some really jacked right you know like me right greg that was exactly yeah. <laughs> yes captain that's that was exactly what i was thinking well, i think that uh something i love about the marine corps is um we come in all shapes and sizes and you know the marine corps would say today we, we really like it doesn't matter where you come from how much you weigh as long as you meet the standards right right um who you go home to at night what is or isn't between your legs we care how you fight and Dan Daly's the embodiment of that. My roommate at the infantry officer course was 130 pounds soaking wet. And I saw him carry his body weight for 10 miles while, you know, larger men were falling out behind. So much of what we do in the Marine Corps, it's about mental toughness and a will to win. Dan Daly had the will to win. And that will was embodied by his very famous quote. Uh, as the Marines were about to march across the wheat field, and those, you know, these young 18, 19, 20 year old young men, the fear enters their eyes or they realize I may die yeah. in the next moment. If I stand up and walk across this field, that may be my last moment, you know, drawing and breath. It, it and will, for many it, it was, was yeah. right? But Dan Daly knew how to fight through that. And he stood up, turned around and looked at his Marines and said, come on, you sons of bitches. Do you want to live forever? I mean, that, if that doesn't grip you... <laughs> I mean, oh, it does. That's the Marine yeah. Corps in a nutshell. And you know, we talked so earlier about how this battle would become so much of of the Marine Corps' ethos. It's men like George Hamilton killing four Germans with his bare hands, or Lloyd Williams saying, "Retreat, hell, we just got here," yeah. or Dan Daly saying, "Do you want to live forever?" But it is an unusually packed, singular battle. Yes. Yeah. And you and I were talking about this before we came on air, but there were four future commandants in the Marine Corps present in this small 4th Marine Brigade, um, including, you know, famous Marines like General John Lejeune, um, future General Clifton Cates. You know, one part of the battle in the 6th that often gets overlooked, Lieutenant at the time, Clifton Cates, um, led the remainder of his company. He was a company commander and his company had, you know, he, he started with 250 Marines marching across this wheat field and got to the other side to the town of Baresh with 19 Marines. 19 Marines. I mean, he, he got to the other side with 8% of his fighting force and took the entire town of Baresh with 19 Marines. I mean, that's, that is the embodiment of our service. They had the will to win. 
He was not turning around. Clifton Cates, who later became the commandant of the Marine Corps in the late 1930s, he was not quitting on his men. The, the, the 231 Marines that did not make it across that wheat field, their sacrifice would not be in vain because he and 18 other Marines went door to door through the entire town of Baresh, which was you know, inhabited at the time street by German soldiers. Just, again, gruesome stuff. It, street fighting is, not only is it gruesome, it is challenging. It is so challenging because threats are everywhere. Right. And they're not just at eye level. Corners, yeah. They're on the second story. They're on the third story. They're in a gutter, right? It is It is a three-dimensional fight. And Clifton Cates, a young Marine officer, led 19 Marines through that town and seized it. So the 6th of June, I mean, it, it, it is. it lives famously in Marine Corps history as a day when many legends were born that we now revere, you know, in the annals of Marine Corps history. When I was at officer candidate school, you know, a, a, a young cadet at the Air Force Academy at the time, learning about Marine Corps history, I was like, my God, look at these people. Like these, these are just icons of humankind. And so many of them on 6 June 1918 were in this one square mile forest called Bois de Belo, which would later be named, uh, be renamed to Bois de la Brigade de la Marine, right? Yep. Um, as an honor by the French. And the French were so impressed with the Marines' performance that they awarded the 5th and 6th Marine regiments with what is called the French Forger. Uh, it's essentially a high military honor saying, hey, the sacrifice that you gave is something that we as French will always remember and honor. And to this day, as we sit here on, you know, in May of 2023, the 5th and 6th Marine Regiment still wear the French Forger on their left shoulder. Really? Uh, yes. When I, and, and you only wear it while you're in that unit. When I was at 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, I became a part of that legacy, having not earned it, right? But the legacy that was earned by the men and women. Uh, yeah, that is passed down, it is down a century is. later. That yeah. It, yeah, it like remains. That, that French Forger is still part of our heritage. Um, so uh, that the 6th of June, uh, come back to it, that is... Legends were born in the Marine Corps that day. And I might add, most of those legendary gains were not there on the 7th. It, it took all the way until, you know, it was a 20-day fight before the Marines could finally write back to General Pershing yeah. and say, um, Bella, Wood. Bella Wood is entirely in Marine Corps, right? Um, that was a long fight. And it was a fight where many lessons were learned in blood. The Marine Corps sustained, as you mentioned earlier, more casualties on June 6th, 1918, than the entire service had sustained at that point in its nearly, in its 143 years of existence. More casualties in a single day. It's, there aren't words for that. I, and that's where, you know, as I was going through this battle, I mean, uh, you know, I really appreciated your input and, and I, I could see even as an outsider, just what, a massive uh, molding, shaping, mm -hmm. you know, formative event uh, this clearly played yeah. for, for the core. And, and, you know, we talked about the legend that it became, this, this fight became. As I mentioned earlier, history is written by the victor. Um, <laughs> All right. This was, not a, this was not a beautiful fight. This was an ugly fight full of failures on, on behalf of the Marine Corps, failures that led to lessons but they also led to the creation of what would become known as the old breed of Marines. Uh, you know, I've mentioned these legendary Marines that were at the fight in Bella Wood. Um, they became known as the old breed. So let me recommend a book by Eugene Sledge called With the Old Breed. It documents his account of the Pacific Theater in World War II. But Eugene Sledge fought with, you know, the, the old crusty Marines that led the campaign in the Pacific were 19 and 20 year old kids fighting in, in the wheat fields and forests of France. Um, and, and the old breed became legendary. And there's still an old breed in the Marine Corps. It's always that old generation. You know, for here in 2023, the old breed are the Marines who uh, fought in Ramadi in, in 2003 or were in, on the march to Baghdad 
um, in their full chemical gear in the back of an amphibious assault vehicle, sweating like you wouldn't believe in March in, in Iraq, right? right? They're the Marines who, like Kyle Carpenter, who jumped on a grenade to save his friends and lost the use of much of his body and, and lived to tell the story about it. Medal of Honor recipient, phenomenal Marine, good man, right? Um, the old breed still exists, and but that, that idea started during this conflict and it kind of was also accompanied by this phrase that you'll hear thrown around oftentimes. Uh, you ever heard a Marine called Devil Dog? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mentioned that one in, in the episode. Yeah. There you go. So Devil Dog is another one of these colloquialisms that often is given to Marines. And, you know, Marines are described as Devil Dogs. Nowadays, it's, it's, sometimes it's a pejorative term. Like if a Marine does something silly, you say, hey, Devil Dog, was that a good idea? Right? <laughs> um, okay. You know, kind of to give them a hard time. <laughs> right. But Devil Dog... Legend has it came from the Battle of Bella Wood. And I don't want to disappoint the Marines that are listening. Like I was disappointed when I found this out, but the reality is that's not true, right? <laughs> right? right. Um, Devil Dog is a translation of a German her term, Teufelshunde. A terrible German, I'm sure, but Teufelshunde translates to Devil Dog. And that word actually first appeared in, uh, the, I think it was the Lacrosse Journal in Lacrosse, Wisconsin in April of 1918. So two months before the Battle of Bella Wood took place, Marines were being described as devil dogs. And legend has it that that you know, name was cemented in the annals of history at Bella Wood. In fact, there's a memorial at Bella Wood, uh, a f it's a beautiful fountain that has a bulldog's head uh, to celebrate the Marines. It's a uh, bulldog, um, you know, depicting the devil dog. Right. But the reality is that that term did not come from this fight. It did come from the First World War. Whether it came from a German or not is up for debate. <laughs> it, it may have been sure. something that American, you know, that Marines, it, we are known to be arrogant as Marines. So that might have been a nickname we gave ourselves. But one way or another, it's part of the legend of, of this fight in France. And, um, uh, you know, as a Teufels, Teufelshunde myself, I'm, I'm proud to look back and say that these were great men who fought this fight. Well, Captain, uh, I'm just nothing but grateful for your insider's perspective here. Um, we're closing in on our on our window. Is there anything else that you think you know we really need to hit that that that's crucial to understanding how this battle you know has formed and informed mm -hmm. what what the Marine Corps is even now in the 21st century? Yeah, the last point I'll I'll make here is that. And I mentioned this earlier, war is really ugly. Yeah. And I don't want that to be lost on a listener. Um, I always like, and you know, see, I'm, I, I'm of Pennsylvania descent uh, back when we get back to Civil War mm -hmm. era. So you'll just have to forgive me, my Southern friend. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll go ahead and quote the great Union General, <laughs> um, uh, Kump, William Tecumseh Sherman. Yeah. Uh, war is hell. Mm -hmm. Right. It, that has just stuck with me um, for years. Yeah, it, it, it's hell and it's humility. And, you know, again, Battle of Gettysburg, when Pickett's Charge failed and the Confederate soldiers marched back across the field, uh, General Lee, on his horse, Traveler, mm -hmm. walked out among his men and grabbed their hands and in tears looked at them and said, it has been all my fault. God, that just pierces my heart. Like that, that's an example of humility in a leader. And you saw humility in leaders after Bella Wood. The Marines learned lessons here. It was not all sunshine and rainbows, yeah. right? No war is. There are legends born out of this fight and legends that, as I just mentioned, are not always grounded in reality. But the fact of the matter is, part of that legend is hard lessons learned in blood. And the Marines who didn't make it home from Bella Wood, killed or missing, right? There, there's a beautiful cemetery, uh, American cemetery at Bella Wood, and soldiers. I might add, there were there were American soldiers, Army soldiers that were a part of this fight, right? And they they often get overlooked because so much of the story and the lore yeah, is about it's, the it's, Marines. It's focused on the Marines. Yeah, the the ones that didn't make it back, they they are the lesson. They are the lesson that we have to look back and learn. And, and look at this fight and say, how do we have to change as a service? And, and we did. You know, there's, 
I, I very much, um, enjoy is the wrong word yet. It's the one that comes to mind. Um, maybe it's just find important. I, I make it a point when I'm or, or in the vicinity of, uh, of a military cemetery to visit, um, nothing I think will cure any fallacious romanticization mm-hmm. faster than reading the names yeah. and looking at the dates. Yeah. Those were fathers. Those were husbands. Yeah. Those were sons, daughters, right? Sometimes, you know, that the, one of the first ones I actually got to was, was Normandy mm. in France. Mm. And it was my, like <laughs> my first time abroad. Um, and I remember just seeing this count, you know, this endless sea of white crosses speckled with the occasional star of David and reading those names and it hitting me. War is ugly. Well, and, and that so many of them were barely young, older than me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I was a high school kid. Yeah. Anyhow. Uh, we, we we need to wrap up. I'm, this is and, a great conversation, Greg. Thanks well, for letting me be a part of it and telling the Marine Corps story as well or poorly as it came across. Oh, it, is a, it is a legend in our history and um, one that I'm thankful that you covered because Marines are, are honored by that episode. Well, thank you very much. And I, I appreciate, you know, it's it's always kind of serendipitous. I, you know, I'm, I'm not some big uh, Hollywood uh, based, uh, nothing against that, but, you know, I don't have a, an army of producers and, and whatnot that can line up, you know, the, the, um, well, just line up I- anyone to, to, to go into some, some of these conversations. So when I find lightning strikes, essentially, right. Like I happen to meet somebody and, mm. and, and, and I can really see, Hey, there's a meaningful conversation that can happen here and, and, and you know, something worthwhile. And, um, seeing your passion. I mean, I felt it here again, uh, for this history at, uh, I really appreciate being able to get kind of that, that insider perspective, you know? So thank you very much for yeah, providing that. Absolutely. And absolutely. Uh, again, to, to the note to end on that, you know, war, war is hell. And I appreciate that you are so, uh, careful, you know, and, and thoughtful in both, your your interest in protecting the United States and, and serving, and yet you know there's I, I don't see the that romanticization. I think that's a great uh, it's a, it's a great place to be as all. Well. Yeah, and as a Marine who's never seen combat, I you know I don't say that lightly. It's an yeah. experience that I don't have, but it's an experience that I know for many Marines uh, will forever forever change who they are. Yeah, and I see it in many Marines I've led and and been led by. So. Um, it's, it's next time you see a Marine, shake their hand and tell them thank you because they sign up for, as, as do our soldiers, sailors, and airmen, they sign up for something that in, in the, in the life of a human being should not be done, but it is a reality of this world in which we live. So Semper Fidelis to all the Marines listening. Thank you, devil dogs. And thank you, Greg, for having me. My pleasure. Thanks again. And, uh, join me in two weeks. We will continue on with our narrative history of World War I. We'll see you then. History That Doesn't Suck is created and hosted by me, Greg Jackson. Special thanks to today's guest, Captain Mac Caldwell. Production by Airship. Sound design by Molly Bach. Theme music composed by Greg Jackson. Arrangement and additional composition by Lindsey Graham of Airship. HTDS is supported by fans at patreon.com forward slash history that doesn't suck. My gratitude to kind soul providing funding to help us keep going. Thank you. And a special thanks to our patrons whose monthly gift puts them at producer status. Amanda Bragg, Art Lane, Ben Kelly, Beth M. Chris Jansen, Bill Thompson, Bob Drazovich, Brad Herman, Brian Goodson, Shannon Stewart, Charles and Shirley Clendenden, Chris Mendoza, Christopher Cottle, Christopher Merchant, Christopher Pullman, David Aubrey, David and Holly Cottle, David DeFazio, Durante Spencer, Donald Moore, Henry Brunges, James Black, James Lilly, Jeannie McCreary, Jeffrey Moots, Jennifer Magnolia, Jessica Popic, Joe Dobis, John Frugal Dugal, John Keller, John Oliveros, John Ridlevich, John Scofield, John Schaefer, Jordan Corbett, Juliana Tabor, Justin M. Spriggs, Karen Bartholomew, Christine Kenny, Kyle Decker, Lawrence Neubauer, Liz McNeil, Logan Hilbrand, Mark Ellis, Matthew Mitchell, Melanie Jan, Michael Umbright, Michael Healy, Natalie Brewer, Nick Navoda, Ogade Khan, Paul Goringer, Rich Miller, Richard Milbert, Rick Brown, Roberto Asenzi, Sarah Trewick, Sean Pepper, Scott Slaymaker, Sharon Thiesen, Sean Baines, Sue Lane, 
Creepy Girl, Thomas Bug, Thomas Stewart, Tisha Black, Todd Kine, Tony Hurst, Victoria Bennett, and Zach Jackson. Join me in two weeks, where I'd like to tell you a story.